possible as we prepare for base. And um, this talk is going to be a mixture of several us talking. Samir is going to cover um, the portion that goes from the remote, uh, from top of the atmosphere to get us some remote sensing because we don't know how to do that. Um, and then we're going to cover some basics and, and Jesse and I kind of spoke about this and we're going to talk about two different stories, two different views of, of base ocean color products. One detail tells you a little bit of a story about water quality and the second one it tells you kind of more of a climate story because we have so many products um, as you're going to see. So um, some of the slides have been also provided by Lachlan McKenna who is one of our project scientists but he lives in Australia, he's lucky, he's there surfing, kind of maybe not. But he's not here uh, with us. But he provided slides, so you're gonna, I'm going to make sure to you know, tell you which slides are his. So, um, Pace Ocean, why do we care? I mean, oceans, duh, control the climate. Um, and oceans and life in, in it controls the climate. Um, ocean and life in it are a critical part of our economy, to make that twist. You know, like we all ate crabs yesterday. I mean, most of us ate crabs yesterday. People who don't eat crabs maybe eat some stuff that has like jello, so there's algae in there. Uh, we all like sushi or don't like sushi. There's so much that we depend on this economy. If we don't eat anything from the ocean, we like to surf in anything. I'm like preaching to the choir. We all know that ocean is important. Phytoplankton that is very cool and, and kind of most important, one of the most important selling points of PACE are, are crucial because they're based on the marine food web. Majority of the carbon that is in the ocean that kind of exists in this biota is coming from the phytoplankton. Phytoplankton does this magical thing that I'm going to talk a little bit about called photosynthesis. And, and through that, it produces the food for the marine web, but also you know, produces the oxygen that we breathe. Somewhere around 50% of globally produced, historically, oxygen is produced by phytoplankton. And, and it draws down carbon dioxide. And I'm going to explain a little bit how, how, how it's impacting that drawdown of the carbon dioxide, especially anthropogenic one, because there's sometimes a little bit mystery about that stuff. But what makes super special, what is super special about PACE is that, you know, by parallel, obser ob these parallel observations of the atmosphere and ocean is going to give us this insight of this connectivity. I mean, Earth is a system of systems. When we talk about ocean, we're kind of like not existing in a space that is not connected to, to the air. It's not connected to the atmosphere. These systems interact. So we're still in stages that um, we're going to be focusing on ocean color products. But, you know, I want you guys, as we're going towards this exercise that uh, uh, Lorraine is going to do, think about this interconnectivity. And you guys are brought here together to build this interconnectivity, um, you know, to at least learn the language that we each use so we can start building these interdisciplinary projects that are going to be like really, I like, think, the coolest thing about PACE. Um, but before I go to the next slide, um, let's see, who uses ocean color products here? Which products do you guys use? Okay, yell it out there so Jessica can write it down. Let's see. Chlorophyll. Yay, chlorophyll, of course. <laughs> okay, what next? Anything else? RS. Woohoo, RS. It's cold here. What else do we have? Oh, fluorescence line high. There's an exotic one. Ooh, -hoo. we have some phytoplankton people here. Good. Anything else? Carbon. carbon. I like carbon. What else? Anything else exotic out there? Backscatter. Backscatter. Good. That's that's an exotic one, I think. <laughs> it is. It's an exotic. What? 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 KD, good. Oh. See. <laughs> See, surface temperature is great, but you know, like pace is not going to be producing. But I'll be, I'll be talking about that one a little bit. MPP, net primary productivity, really important parameter. High chlorophyll. IPAR, yes. Yeah, sorry, I'm like. So IPAR is just like a measurement of a cutaneous PAR, like just how much light, um, I think, we're not going to cover exactly PAR, but it's just the amount of light that reaches the surface and can be propagated through the water column, and it's available for phytoplankton to do their magic. I missed something. I missed something, yeah. Yeah, MPP. Okay, cool. That's a good list. That's a really good list because that's pretty much the list of the things that, that, you know, that PACE is going to be making. You guys missed some, and there's going to be many, many more that we're going to be producing. But pretty much this stuff is here. And two different color codings are actually showing you the, the things that we really have to make, which are in blue, and things that we really want to make, which are in, in gray. And we want to make the things that we have to do as well. 
But I think the cool things are, are you know, kind of hidden in, in between the gray, at least from my perspective, this idea of bringing phytoplankton into community structure. Um, it's really important for me, and I think it's going to give us much more better insight in any questions that we have when it comes to the oceanic realm, no? But you can see many, many of them here, and, and quite a lot of them, actually, there's quite a lot of overlap. So, and the blue ones are, some of the blue ones are these, like, important climate variables, so-called essential climate variables, or essential marine variables. There's different, different definitions and stuff, and we're going to keep on producing them just because we want to have this long, like long data set so we can actually look at the impacts that, that you know, climate change has on, on the systems around us. So we're going to keep on producing this stuff, but we're going to bring some new things along. So if you look at all these things together and actually put them as a, some kind of crazy diagram like this one that I made, you can see that there's lots of connectivity between them. What it, this actually means that, that you know, when we start with top of the atmosphere and thanks to Amir, not me, <laughs> get us to RRS, things start getting produced, and there are really lots of interconnection. And what is, what, is, what is really important for you to think is, as we're going along, can we treat these things as independent variables? Um, I'm talking about this because quite a lot of people, our users, are modelers. You know, and they're going to take some of our products and treat them as an independent variable. But there's nothing independent because our first stop, m most of them, first stop is stop with the atmosphere, apply atmospheric correction, and we connect them all. And as we're going down the line, as we're going down these, 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 like this hierarchy of, of products, we're not just not losing independence, but we're also accumulating the uncertainty. So those are the things I, I really like to look at the products in this crazy realm, just to understand that everything is interconnected, but also as we're getting more complex, we're, we're accumulating like poop, we're accumulating trash. And, and one thing that we're doing with, with PACE, and we're going to be talking about that on Friday, we're really trying really, really hard to, to keep good track of those uncertainties. All right. So to get us from the top of the atmosphere to RRS is my dear colleague Amir. He's going to take over. Um, and oh my god, we're so slow. I have to, I'm going to have to speed up. Uh, good morning. Um, so I'm Amir Ibrahim. Uh, I'm the project science lead for atmospheric correction. Uh, and I will primarily focus today on uh, developing or looking at uh, PACE uh, OC, um, atmospheric correction for OCI, which is the main instrument on, uh, on the PACE of light, uh, the ocean coloring instrument. Um, so I just wanted to clarify one thing that Ivana uh, was talking about is <laughs> I'm not the person who is really doing, like there is tons of heritage uh, that we're still relying on to take us from the top of the atmosphere to the remote sensor reflectance. And was the PACE mission where uh, primarily um, um, utilizing this heritage, uh, these heritage algorithms and these heritage processes, which are very much proven that would allow us to um, get to an accurate RRS, ref uh, remote sensor reflectance for the ocean. So I don't know what happened to the slides, <laughs> but um, basically, um, uh, what I wanted to, you already probably have seen that uh, already in previous talks, but what really causes the uh, variation of the color in the ocean is primarily things happening in the, in the ocean itself uh, due to the absorption and scattering of uh, different types of particles, uh, such as uh, organic and non-organic particles, as well as dissolved particles. And as you can see from this figure here on the, on the, on the right-hand side, is there, is there a pointer actually I could use? Okay. Oh, thank you. The, um, this, is, this figure here is actually the uh, remote sensor reflectance uh, for different uh, water colors. And as you can see, the shape, uh, the spectral shape, and the magnitude of the RRS will change depending on the water color, it's color itself. And this is because, again, of the absorption and scattering properties of the, uh, of the ocean. So what do we actually see from a uh, space-borne uh, sensor? So this is actually an image, a uh, true color image from uh, Modus Aqua. Uh, uh, this is the Rio de la Plata region uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. And as you can see from this figure, it's very much diverse in color. Uh, it goes from extremely turbid water conditions here all the way to open water conditions. And you can see all these swirls are basically uh, phytoplankton blooms. So, but this is not always pretty <laughs> image like that. There is, of course, the atmosphere that uh, interferes between what, what we, we see from a satellite sensor 
to the surface reflectance. Uh, this is another image from Veer's MPP. And uh, as you can see here, this is the uh, west coast of Africa. And you can see these dust and, and uh, uh, carbon uh, plumes over the Atlantic Ocean. And all of these aerosol uh, signatures basically interferes with the, with the ocean that we're, we're trying to retrieve. And it makes the atmospheric correction a very complicated process. So as you already know that ocean color is a passive remote sensing technique, you still need the solar radiation uh, or what we, know, what we call also the solar irradiance spectra. Um, this is uh, through year 2002. Um, and, the, um, and basically the, the light from the sun um, scatters uh, in the atmosphere and propagates through the atmosphere, go through the air water interface and then uh, Scattering, additional scattering processes happen in the ocean. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to, um, and, and this light basically propagate back through the interface again, all the way back to a sensor. So what uh, an instrument like PACE would see basically, the light that reach, reach the satellite is the combination of the light from the atmosphere, as well as from the, uh, as well as the light reflected from the sea surface itself, like glint and white caps. Uh, and it, in addition to that, the water signal, that which is our target, this is what we're actually trying to retrieve. So in here, here in this figure, uh, this is the top of the atmosphere uh, radiance. Um, and I'm, here I'm overlaying the uh, what uh, OCI, this is based on simulated data, uh, data, and this is what OCI would see. So it's a hyperspectral instrument. It will observe the light at 239 uh, bands, uh, including the sphere bands. And this is what we would see from MODIS. So obviously there are tons of information that OCI would see uh, and it captures a lot of these features, spectral features that an instrument like MODIS or CWIS, multi-spectral instrument, would not observe. Of course, a lot of these features are coming from the atmosphere itself. So we have to compensate for these features in order to, to do a proper atmospheric correction. And what we're trying to do is we're basically trying to get to the uh, reflectance of the ocean. So here I'm showing some spectra for different types of uh, surfaces, uh, from snow, vegetation, uh, dry soil, and our little tiny signal here is the water itself. So and I get this quote actually from the PACE website, one scientist noise is another signal. And this is actually true. We're really looking at a very tiny signal from the top of the atmosphere compared to other disciplines where, or, or, or looking at other surfaces where you're looking at clouds or land and so on. So it's really imperative to do a proper atmospheric correction or in order to get to that tiny signal from the top of the atmosphere. And what we want to do from that is basically, as Ivana said, we want to produce these global images um, of, um, of different ocean color products, such as, you know, this is phytoplankton or uh, ocean chlorophyll, I'm sorry. Um, this is coming from sea waves, and uh, uh, this is our goal. We want to get global, uh, we want to be able to monitor the global ocean uh, uh, from the satellite observation. So quick definition to what remote sensing is. Uh, remote sensor reflectance, or RRS, uh, has a unit to radiance. It's basically defined as the upwelling light uh, or radiance just above the surface divided by the downwelling irradiance. And uh, the, the upwelling radiance has units of watts per meter square per micrometer per radiance, and the downwelling radiance has watts per meter square per micrometer. And this, when you do this division, you end up with per radiance unit. And of course, I also wanted to uh, mention uh, another uh, um, parameter that we use to describe the reflectance of the ocean is the is the water leaving reflectance. Uh, it's a unitless, it's basically the uh, pi multiplied by RS and pi is, has the radiance unit, so that's why it's a unitless me uh, metric. Um, so again, because for the PACE mission, it's, um, we, we need to, um, uh, there are certain requirements coming from NASA, where I think Jeremy probably talked about this. And what we need to do is, we want to be able to produce the water leaving reflectance within a certain predetermined uh, accuracy or uncertainty. There is a base, this is our baseline uncertainty here. So in order to get there, we do the atmospheric correction. These the requirements are defined using OCI alone. So we want to be able to retrieve the water leaving uh, reflectance uh, using OCI alone and meet these uh, baseline uh, uncertainty requirements. And these are different uncertainty requirements for different region of the spectra. So this is from the UV visible and in a near infrared 
you can see in the UV it's a little bit higher. It's at still new territory for us. In order to do atmospheric correction, the UV could be actually a big challenge. Uh, so it's really uh, important for us to meet these uncertainty requirements to declare that there is a mission success. And from there we go all to the amazing uh, ocean color product that Yvonne talked about earlier. Um, so this is the atmospheric correction uh, uh, formalism. Um, um, so this is the this is the transmittance uh, hyperspectrally from the UV all the way to all the way to uh, uh, the shortwave infrared. As you can see from uh, uh, this is the uh, diffuse transmittance in the red curve, and this is the uh, the the absorbing gas transmittance. Um, so traditionally, for all ocean color sensors, we primarily observe the light at what we call window bands, where we basically try to avoid looking at the light in very uh, in regions where uh, spectral regions where there is a strong uh, gas absorption, such as uh, uh, oxygen and water vapor. But since for OCI we want to look at the light hyperspectrally we're going to uh, see a lot of these absorption uh, features in the spectra and we want to make sure that we can correct or compensate for these spectral features to get to hyperspectral RRS. <coughs> and uh, so basically this equation here describes what, uh, what we would see from the tau of the atmosphere, the tau of the atmosphere radiance. Uh, if we assume the light to be, uh, can be, uh, the different radiometric contribution of the atmosphere ocean system can be actually summed. So um, using this assumption, we, we can basically sum the molecular array lay scattering term uh, and plus the aerosol, uh, aerosol uh, radiometric contribution on top of the atmosphere and the array lay aerosol interaction as well as the, the, uh, the white caps uh, radiometric contribution on top of the atmosphere as well as the glint, and then the, uh, the water leaving uh, radiance also at the top of the atmosphere, and all of that is modulated by the, uh, by the gas uh, transmittance. And of course, our target is we want to retrieve the water leaving uh, radiance. So, so, um, so basically, uh, this, again, this slide kind of highlights what the, uh, the magnitude of the water leaving radiance. Um, I think Jeremy might have uh, <laughs> spoken about this before, so I would probably just skip it, but I, all I want to highlight that the water leaving radiance is such a small signal compared to uh, all other um, radiometric contributions, such as the aerosols and the relay, as well as the glint. So how do we do atmospheric correction right now? So we have uh, within uh, the um, Ocean Biology Processing Group at uh, the Ocean Ecology Lab, we basically have uh, the L2Gen module, which is a, a, it's a processing module. It's a bunch of codes that take basically uh, um, the level one uh, data and process all the way through uh, level two. And all of this is packaged in, uh, under the CDAS uh, uh, software package that Basically, Ken does all the processing from level zero all the way to level uh, level three. So, L2Gen is only just a submodule of CDAS, and what it does is it takes the calibrated tau of the atmosphere reflectances hyperspectrally, you know, from sensors like HICO or in you, in, on, uh, or OCI, and then basically run this through the atmospheric correction code. And what we do is we have uh, sensor-specific lookup tables for the Rayleigh and aerosol. Uh, uh, radiances or reflectances that are uh, pre-computed using radio transfer code, uh, code. and then uh, this is also ingested through the L2Gen module as well as ancillary data uh, uh, from external sources such as pressure, humidity, wind speed, and ozone, and NO2, and so on. And all of this information goes through the L2Gen module to calculate level two, uh, level two product. It's important to say that the atmospheric correction is highly ill post problem means that we don't have, it's always we don't have enough information to tell us everything about the atmosphere ocean system. So we always have to supplement the algorithm with ancillary or external data sources. Basically the algorithms are, uh, the, uh, the, the measurements are not, uh, um, does not have the ability to discern all of these additional information because it's highly ill post basically. If changing, changing ancillary data can be uh, intermixed with changing things in the ocean or in the other things related to the aerosol. So it's really hard to discern. So you need to constrain the problem. 
And then basically we go through, uh, once we get to level two product, we, uh, we also uh, apply a vicarious calibration process that Jeremy is gonna talk about, and of course go through the validation process and so on, which we'll talk about on Friday. So Rayleigh scattering, um, Rayleigh scattering uh, is the biggest uh, uh, radiometric contribution out of the atmosphere. And, uh, and it's really important to accurately calculate the Rayleigh scattering in order to remove that big contribution to, to do proper atmospheric correction. So the way we do this is we use uh, vector radiative transfer codes where we basically generate a uh, lookup table of a permutated set of uh, geometry, solar angle, sensor angle, relative azimuth, and wind speed. Uh, as well as we do adjustment uh, uh, using the surface pressure information uh, to the Rayleigh scattering because basically Rayleigh very much depends on uh, the, uh, the Rayleigh optical thickness that is a strong function of the uh, surface pressure. Um, this is actually a schematic figure here shows that um, um, the, the Rayleigh scattering, um, the light distribution of the Rayleigh scattering um, and uh, this figure here shows the spectral dependence of the, uh, of the uh, Rayleigh uh, radi uh, reflectance basically as function of wavelengths and it uh, primarily has this uh, uh, power law dependency uh, with wavelengths where basically the uh, radiometric contribution of the Rayleigh is significantly higher in the blue and the UV wavelengths than in the red wavelengths. So that's why it's really ac uh, important to get an accurate Rayleigh really scattering uh, at that uh, part of the spectrum. Um, the next thing um, I want to talk about is, as we said before, we still have to do a proper gas correction in order to uh, get the hyperspectral RS, which we would use then to develop uh, other ocean color products. So uh, the way we do the gas absorption is we basically generate uh, gas absorption cross sections uh, for all gas species in the atmosphere uh, using a line by line reduced um, uh, line by line um, um, absorption uh, database from Hytron, and then we generate the, the sensor specific table after our, uh, applying the uh, spectral response function of the instrument, uh, and basically. Uh, we get ancillary information from ancillary sources. We get information about the gas concentration in the atmosphere to do the atmospheric correction. Uh, <clears throat> the the only caveat to that is, for um, water vapor actually is an issue uh, for the, for these kind of measurements. Uh, that's primarily because uh, water vapor is um, uh, very uh, spatially and temporally. So um, uh, on 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 small scale, so it's really uh, it would be a lot better to infer the uh, water vapor uh, concentration from the OCI, uh, from OCI measurements, which OCI will have the capability to do that. So what we do is we use this, um, this uh, ATREM, uh, the ATREM heritage, uh, which is um, algorithm developed by Bo Kai Gao back, I believe, in the 80s. Um, it's mainly developed for um, MODIS, but we're reutilizing that for hyperspectral measurements. Uh, so it's basically, uh, this is the uh, reflectance spectra, and because of the water vapor absorption feature, you get these dips in the spectra, and depending on the amount of uh, water vapor in the atmosphere, this dip uh, in the spectra will change. So higher water vapor, you'll get stronger dip. Lower water vapor will be uh, the other way around. And using the three band ratio algorithm, assume, uh, looking at the reflectance uh, in two window bands versus one absorption band, we kind of can uh, relate that uh, transmittance ratio, the three band transmittance ratio, uh, to the water vapor amount. And from that, we can calculate the column water vapor and then do a proper atmospheric uh, uh, gas correction. And this is actually an image from uh, Heiko, uh, just showing you the uh, variability of the uh, column water vapor amount here in this axis, and this is in centimeter units, and you can see that the variability is pretty significant even on a small spatial scale. So this is really important to do this kind of correction properly. <sighs> then uh, going to the direct sun glint, um, of course uh, glint is an issue. Actually this is an image that I took uh, from um, on the top of a mountain in um, Dubrovnik. <laughs> this is Dubrovnik. <laughs> uh, it's a really beautiful place, but uh, this image actually showing you a very, uh, the, the direct sun glint, um, <clears throat> and we need to correct for that as well. Um, so the way we calculate the, uh, the glint is 
we need to calculate the glint at the surface. And then from there, we, we, we need to estimate the glint of the toroidal atmosphere. So we use this Beer's Law relationship um, to, to translate the, the glint at the surface level all the way to the top of the atmosphere in order to remove that from, uh, from, the, um, from the top of the atmosphere signal. And the way we model this uh, normalized glint coefficient is we, um, we use basically uh, for neural reflection models uh, where we parameterize the wave surfaces using this Coxon-Monk relationship. It's basically a relationship that relates the uh, wind speed to the wave slope statistics. And from that, we can have an a better estimate of the uh, ref uh, ocean reflectance with different wind speeds. And uh, so this figure shows you the normalized glint coefficient, specific geometry. And one thing important to note is that we have a threshold in our algorithms that will basically say that when the glint threshold above 0 0.005, that means there is a strong glint there, and therefore don't even attempt to retrieve the, uh, the, the ocean from there uh, because the glint signal will be significantly higher. That will be very challenging to, uh, to do a proper atmospheric correction. Of course, we want to um, improve upon that, but um, the one interesting thing is that um, OCI actually, oh, I just wanted to show that this image here basically shows you, uh, this is an image from, I believe, Olchi, where um, we're showing the glint uh, before and after the glint, glint correction. So, uh, so once you remove the glint signal, you, get, you, you basically have the ability to better get ocean color from it. But uh, OCI is unique. Uh, OCI will have tilting capability. So um, sensors like MODIS, uh, has a lot of these issues where you basically see a uh, strong glint because it does not tilt. Uh, but if you can just tilt OCI 20 degrees or so, you can significantly reduce the, air, the coverage of the glint within your scene. So, um, so this is a comparison between, uh, this is for the power product uh, comparing between uh, MODIS and, uh, and uh, CWIFs. CWIFs had the tilting capability similar to what OCI would, uh, would see, and you can see basically um, that uh, for CWFs, the glint is significantly reduced compared to the glint in what MODIS would see. And this is what we're actually gonna see from OCI. So this image is a level three image, a level three image of the chlorophyll concentration. Uh, this is a one, uh, one day image. It's a daily image or daily composite. Uh, from MODIS, and uh, as you can see, the, uh, the, the of course there are the orbit gaps, but there is like this strong glint area here where we cannot do proper retrieval there. But for OCI, we will tilt, and we will be able to reduce the glint region significantly. So this is actually um, a simulated data uh, from uh, what from a uh, process uh, from um, a simulator called PyToast. Uh, I think Fred is going to talk about it tomorrow. So we basically, given the orbit geometry, we can actually simulate realistic scenes uh, for what OCI would see, and then run this, uh, this, uh, these images through the l 2 gen processing module to get to the uh, you know, ocean color products. So you can see the significant reduction in the glint region. Uh, this is actually uh, in this glint region here, and this is just the uh, the or uh, the uh, tilt gap. So this is a, yeah. So you get rid of your glint, but you introduce a systematic tilt gap. It kills my aerosol. <laughs> but you know, you're you're trading off. You're you're always missing the same place. You're you're not you're you're not missing the same place. <laughs> so, so I, I know you're, you're producing actually uh, uh, aerosol product with CWIFs. CWIFs has the same tilting. Well, I don't do the CWIFs. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, it's the ocean color, I think it's missing something. I think you can still do the 
very sorry to see what bombs are to get, right? Yeah. Okay. I, uh, I, I don't think there will be data so available in tilt again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, um, we're, we're definitely, um, I'm like, this is an ocean color mission, so <laughs> we still want to <laughs> get the best coverage. <laughs> It, it is, um, yes, you're right, it's interdisciplinary mission, but of course, um, uh, this is the, um, the o OCI is the main instrument that we're gonna use to retrieve uh, information about the ocean, but of course we'll have the multi-angle polarimeters that will can f help us fill some of these gaps. Um, <clears throat> then, um, white caps, how am I doing on time, by the way? Right, here's the timer. Um, okay. um, there is also the white caps. White caps is uh, another problem. So we need to correct for the, uh, the, this white cap signal when you have a really high wind speed conditions. So I took this image actually, um, and it was a really stormy day. So <laughs> you really don't observe these kind of white caps conditions uh, in, in, um, uh, from satellite data, primarily because it's, uh, usually it's very, very cloudy and you cannot do retrievals in these conditions. So this is what we call developed seas. But for un, uh, undeveloped seas, you, uh, you can still see some kind of white caps um, in, in the, on the ocean surface that you need to correct for. And the way we do that is we relate the wind speed uh, at 10 meter uh, altitude to the white caps fraction uh, using this empirical relationship. And from there, we can basically calculate the, uh, the white caps uh, reflectance um, given the absorption of the uh, absorption of spectra of white caps itself. So this absorption spectra is spectrally dependent. And, and uh, this figure here shows you the, uh, the dependence of the, uh, white, the white caps reflectance on the wind speed. So of course, higher wind speed means that higher white caps fraction was in your pixel and that corresponds to higher water uh, hot, higher uh, white caps reflectance. So the aerosol challenge, this is the <laughs> biggest concern. So of course aerosols is, uh, has a complex morphology um, um, and shape, chemical composition, and size distribution. So, um, so it is really, um, 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 and the way that we basically uh, approximate this complex shape is we kind of use me 30 or things like uh, non, um, um, T matrix or something like that, elliptical shape. But uh, for, for ocean color algorithm, we, we primarily approximate things as a uh, mu scattering. Of course, uh, this will introduce additional uncertainties and therefore you need to improve these aerosol models. But this here figure shows you the phase function as a function of scattering angle for different aerosol types. Uh, dust, smoke, and, and, and salt, or sea salt. And the, var the, the phase function, which describes the probability of the photon scattering at different directions, basically, um, it varies significantly depending on the aerosol type. Not only the aerosol type is, um, 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 is the issue, but also the aerosol varies spatially and temporally. So this is the um, simula uh, simulation from uh, GUS5 model from uh, GMO at Goddard. And you can see basically these are the dust plumes and, and carbon and sea salt, they really vary spatially and temporally. So you really need to infer the information about the aerosol from the top of the atmosphere signal in order to, uh, to do a pr uh, proper atmospheric correction. So the way we model the uh, aerosol microphysical properties or the aerosol microphysical model is that we need to know information about the um, Ref, uh, the complex refractive indices, the real and imaginary part of refractive indices for different uh, water, uh, for different aerosol types. And uh, uh, what we do in, in the operational or the standard uh, pro uh, processing algorithm is that we basically have 80 aerosol model uh, based on the AMA 2010 paper, where we basically relate, we have 10 uh, aerosol um, fine mode fractions, uh, um, coarse mode aerosol and fine mode aerosol. This is the, uh, this figure here shows you the, um, the uh, size distribution for coarse mode aerosol and fine mode aerosols. 
uh, and we uh, basically uh, also add a relative humidity dependence on that. Basically, uh, was the, the, when the particles uh, have more humidity, there is hygroscopic growth uh, on, for, uh, on the aerosol particles that leads to changes in, in the particle size as well, in the aerosol size. So higher humidity, for example, would, would give you bigger aerosol particles. So it is important to uh, account for that information as well. And as you remember, we get the humidity from ancillary data sources. So this is actually a constraining, constraining information about the aerosol properties. And then we infer the information about the fine mode fraction and optical depth from the satellite data in order to do the correction. And this figure here shows you the phase function for different, uh, uh, for different relative humidities. So they do vary also. So if you remember this equation here, we already talked about the Rayleigh. Uh, we model, uh, we, we were talking about modeling the aerosols. We already talked about uh, white caps, glint, and we're still going, trying to retrieve our target here, and we're talking about the gas, the gas absorption. So similar to the Rayleigh, Rayleigh scattering correction, we also create uh, lookup tables. So these lookup tables, um, uh, of the aerosol uh, radiances or reflectances uh, are computed using vector radiated transfer code. Uh, and the input to these codes are basically the uh, aerosol microphysical properties and uh, you know, the parameterized here as uh, for relative humidity, fine mode fraction, different optical depth. Uh, this is calculated hyperspectrally for all wavelengths and different solar, uh, for different solar geometry. So we basically calculate this permutated set uh, of um, of, diff of um, uh, different properties of the atmosphere and different geometries, uh, and we put that in a lookup table, and then we basically perform um, uh, multi-dimensional linear interpolation of these lookup tables to get to the uh, for each pixel in order to infer the information about the aerosol properties. Uh, amaz <laughs> amazingly, we end up with about 3.8 billion data points. Uh, within this lookup table. So these lookup tables are gigantic lookup tables and it require, it takes uh, um, um, days to weeks to basically run the reduced transfer code and, prompt and put that into a lookup table uh, to, uh, to do these calculations. This figure here shows you the, uh, the aerosol reflectance as a function of wavelengths, uh, hyperspectrally, for different fine mode fractions. So basically, uh, they, they find, uh, for different fine mode fractions, you get uh, different spectral dependence. And this is the point of the atmospheric correction is that we want to infer information about the spectral dependence of the aerosol signal from the top of the atmosphere in order to do uh, the atmospheric correction. So the way we do that is we use the black pixel approximation, which, which tells us basically that the ocean is very, uh, is really dark in the near infrared and the shortwave infrared spectrum. That's because of the water absorption is too high, as orders of magnitude higher basically than what you would see in the visible spectrum. So that means that there is no light coming from the ocean at these bands. So what that means is if you have a sensor looking at the light within the spectral region, you can basically say that, comfortably say that there is no water signal there and all of my signal is coming from the surface reflectance as well as the atmosphere, the path radiance itself. So assuming that we do a proper correction to the, to the uh, glint and white caps, and we know that the Rayleigh, what the Rayleigh signal is, then what is left is the aerosol, it is the aerosol signal. And from there, we, uh, use an, we have our algorithm that basically gives us the, uh, the spectral dependence of the aerosol signal that we can use it to infer the information from the near, from the near infrared um, all the way to the visible, because this is where we want to correct for. But of course, the ocean is not always dark. Of course, you know you, you can get significant uh, water leaving radiance uh, or reflectance in the um, in the near infrared part of the spectrum that adds to the challenge. So, the um, just to recap the uh, or uh, the NASA operational or the standard algorithm. It, primarily started from the heritage uh, of Gordon and Wang, 1994. These are the algorithm developed. Uh, for CWFs primarily, and uh, it, it's, it's, uh, these algorithms basically uh, estimate what we call epsilon, which is basically, it's just the ratio of the aerosol reflectance at one band relative to all other bands. So if you know, uh, if you have, if, if you normalize everything at one near infrared band and you have some kind of information uh, from other bands, then you can kind of, uh, infer the spectral dependence of the aerosol signal 
uh, using at least two bands. Uh, and in the Gordon Wang, they had uh, these approaches called the single scattering to multiple scattering calculation, but this is too much detail probably uh, for this. So, um, but basically because of some kind of competi uh, computational limit uh, back in the 80s and um, in the CWF's era, uh, they uh, did these simulations in a single scattering space and then basically translate that information using some kind of uh, uh, polynomial fits to translate that information to multiple scattering, which is what is really happening in the atmosphere. The light multiply scattered, it's not only sc singly scattered. We, we changed that and uh, started in 2010 in the operational algorithm uh, for NASA. We uh, developed the Ahmad 2010 aerosol models, which were different from the shell and fin aerosol model for Gordon Wang. Uh, so we had more comprehensive aerosol uh, models based on aeronet uh, measurements, which is the, um, the, um, um, the robotic network that basically measure information about the aerosol properties uh, in situ. And, uh, and then we developed what we call the multi-scattering epsilon, which basically um, infer the information about the aerosol in the multiple scattering space. So there is no need to do this kind of conversion. And there were several reasons we wanted to do that. You know, one of them is we wanted to basically calculate pixel level uncertainty. It was really challenging to do this uh, with this kind of algorithm, but when we moved to the multiple scattering space, it was, the method was a lot simplified and, and the accuracy of the algorithm improved also a lot. So basically, if you know, if you know the epsilon, uh, the multi-scattering epsilon, uh, at, at least two band, then you can infer, infer the spectral information of the, um, of the, of the aerosol. And then what we, we're trying to do for PACE is use the multiband AC algorithm. So again, you know, the, the Gordon Wang approach and this MSEPS approach primarily calculated the, uh, inferred the aerosol signal using at least two bands. You need only two bands to do that. But since for OCI, we're measuring the light hyperspectral, you have all of these tons of uh, spectral information. So in order to in better infer information about the, the aerosol, we want to use multiple bands. So the idea is to still relying on the black pixel assumption was some caveat to it that I'm going to talk about later. But basically the idea is um, you can infer the aerosol optical depth of one band and then use all of the other bands from the near infrared all the way to the sphere to better infer, infer information about the aerosol properties. And the way we do that is basically, like I said, this schematic diagram, the tau of the atmosphere radiance, we do the Rayleigh gas and Glenn correction. So whatever signal is left at the near, at the near infrared, we, we, it, it is coming from the aerosol, right? And, and from there, we basically say, okay, given my uh, aerosol reflectance, uh, what is my optical depth? So de depending on the magnitude of the aerosol reflectance, we can calculate the optical depth. But again, because we cannot infer the information about the aerosol from only one band, you need multiple bands and that basically showed here in, in this figure for the same reflectance uh, at, at one wavelength, you get multiple, uh, for different aerosol models, you get diff multiple aerosol optical depth. So, um, <clears throat> so of course you need to bring in additional pieces of, of information, uh, which is the, mul the, the multi-band uh, uh, observations basically. So if we have here an observation um, so once we estimate the optical depths for different candidate aerosol models, remember here this, this point is not really overlapping, it's, there are some slight differences between them, and you are using multiple bands to basically infer what is the best aerosol model out of these candidate models from our lookup tables. And, one, and you basically use some kind of chi-square uh, chi minimization technique, where you basically find uh, the closest aerosol model to, to the observation and then from the near infrared to the shortwave inference spectra. And then once you know what the aerosol models, uh, the best aerosol models are, you do some kind of averaging, calculate the transmittances, and you get to basically to the RS and, and you do the, atm the atmospheric correction. Uh, there is this term here, spectral weight, and uh, I'm gonna talk about it next. It's basically in the chi-square function, we add this term spectral weight. And remember we said that because we are, we, the ocean is not always dark, uh, in coastal water, uh, coastal waters, we still want to be able to do atmospheric correction without um, um, uh, having the signal from the ocean interfering with determining what is the best aerosol model is. 
So the idea is that we added a uh, spectral weight information, basically OCI, because OCI will measure the light at uh, uh, different swear bands. In the open ocean, we know that these bands, these sets of bands, similar to the heritage, modus and veers, they're dark. So, and these bands typically have a better radiometric accuracy than a short wave infrared bands. So we want to use the information from these bands to infer the most information about the aerosols. And then when we, we move to coastal waters, where we know that uh, the ocean is, as can be highly turbid, these bands become contaminated. So we want to rely better on the uh, shortwave infrared bands to infer information about the aerosol. That's because, again, of the increased uh, water absorption. So basically, we have a spectral weight here that basically tells us in this chi-square function is that uh, if you're doing retrieval in the uh, in the open ocean, we primarily infer most of our information because it has better radiometric accuracy on the near infrared bands. And then, then we have a spectral weight depending on the um, a bioptical model that basically kind of try to estimate the, um, the, um, the ocean signal. Uh, this is a, a, a bioptical model by Bailey 2010. Uh, to be, it basically try to estimate the ocean reflectance. Um, so it's kind of like an iterative process where you first do the retrieval of RS and then you estimate what the turbidity is of the ocean, then estimate the near infrared signal uh, of the ocean, and then feed it back again to the algorithm to re remove that contamination or contribution. So there is an iterative technique and we basically um, relate the spectral weight to this in the, uh, near infrared iteration. So usually this near infrared iteration kicks in in coastal waters. And the more iterations you have, that's mean you have more difficulty fitting the bioptical model in a near infrared. Therefore, you start to shift the spectral weight in the cost function toward the shortwave infrared. You're basically now want to rely more on the shortwave infrared where you know that the ocean is darker. Of course, the caveat that comes with that is you have more uncertainty from the measurements because the you know, shortwave infrared is not as uh, have radiometric quality as a near infrared, but still improves significantly the, uh, the contamination from, the, from that. I will skip this. Uh, this is actually an example of the multiband AEC algorithm retrieval uh, operationally versus the multiband AEC. This is the chlorophyll, and we can focus only on the Chesapeake region uh, in eastern coast of the US. Uh, this is the angstrom coefficient. Angstrom basically tells you the spectral dependence of the aerosols. When higher spectral uh, depend or higher angstrom means that you have finer mode aerosols, uh, and smaller numbers means coarser mode, uh, mode aerosols. Um, and basically, what you notice is that in the standard algorithm, using only the two bands and near infrared, you get this aerosol signal in the Chesape Chesapeake Bay that is probably coming because of the contamination of the high turbidity in the, in the ocean. And when we do the multiband AC, we basically reduce a lot of these contaminations because you start to rely more in the longer wavelengths, the short wave infrared, so you're inferring better information about the aerosols from there. You're basically reducing the, the, uh, the errors in the aerosol reflectance. And also, one of the reasons we get a lot of these negative uh, RRS is because in some of these water conditions, we tend to uh, overestimate the angstrom coefficient, which leads to an overcorrection of the aerosol signal in the visible spectra. And that gives you basically these uh, negative RRS. Uh, whereas in, if you use the sphere bands, you basically try to, you mitigate this issue and you tend to have a lot less negative RRS. Uh, the last thing in the atmospheric correction, it's very important not to forget about is the BRDF. Of course, because as I said bef uh, before, the definition of RRS is, probably I forgot actually to talk about this. The definition of RRS is looking at the upwilling light um, at, uh, when a sensor looking at nadir and when the sun is at zenith, right? So uh, we never, <laughs> we rarely observe these conditions from sunlight data. So we always observe at oblique angles and the sun angles changing over the scenes and so on. So you need to standardize this RS. And the way to do that is you basically apply uh, a BRDF correction, which basically calculates the um, um, uh, corrects for the uh, RRS from looking at geometry other than the nadir and zenos. And, uh, and, and this is here an example that shows you, you know, that um, the, the reflectance of the ocean uh, for uh, that, the standardized uh, reflectance versus what 
what is observed at uh, certain other geometries. And of course, this process is dependent on the IOPs in the ocean. So we kind of right now we simplify things with only uh, it's chlorophyll dependent. So there is a, like an iterative process going on in there too. So you first estimate chlorophyll from before doing BRDF, and then and then you you feed this chlorophyll into some kind of lookup tables that calculate this BRDF correction in this equation here, and then um, um, and then you basically apply, apply this uh, BRDF correction. So I'm almost done here. So this is the uh, demonstration of the um, hyperspectral RS retrieved from HICO. Um, we don't have a lot of uh, hyperspectral uh, measurements as a proxy to OCI, real measurements. So we have very few uh, measurements that can allow us to test these algorithms hyperspectrally. One of them is HICO. You can actually download the data from the uh, Ocean Color website. And this example here, this is Lake Erie. And uh, this is actually an example of like, why do we care about, for example, doing proper gas correction? So the green curve is the in situ measurements. Uh, here is the RRS in red. This is without doing any water vapor or oxygen correction. So you can see basically, first thing you see is like, there are all of these dips here in the spectra that is really not coming from the ocean. It's from the atmosphere. So if you don't do this kind of correction and you're applying you know, whatever IOP's algorithm uh, on it, you basically would think these absorption features, these wrong features, are maybe coming from phytoplankton, which is not true, right? So, uh, so you really need to do, to do proper uh, gas correction. And uh, so the, the blue and the black curve is basically the, the RS after doing a proper um, gas correction, uh, water vapor and oxygen, and you see a lot of these features basically disappear. And the other issue is also is because, because if you don't do good uh, water vapor and oxygen correction, there are some out band artifacts that impact the determination of the aerosol signal as well. So if you're, have, if you're using bands that are close to the water vapor or oxygen, it kind of like bias your uh, aerosol signal um, and you can end up with a really wrong aerosol type that, to do correction. But with, if you do it properly, you can basically get a lot better spectra here. And basically, we tested also the, uh, these algorithm on uh, the PyTOS data, like I said before, the simulator for uh, OCI. And we kind of like uh, uh, run this operationally. This very critical thing is like we want to develop algorithm that can run operationally at, um, at um, um, and, and basically within a reasonable amount of time and produce a hyperspectral RS. So this is a comparison between the retrieval and the truth. Uh, also, uh, we, we tested the algorithm uh, on, um, uh, on airborne data from Avaris. Uh, so, uh, as you, um, so this is an Aeronet uh, OC site, Wave System, Gulf of Mexico. And this is the normalized water leaving uh, radiance, uh, hyperspectrally from Avaris compared to the in situ data from uh, Aeronet OC. So we get this, this, uh, this nice agreement between them. And of, oh, a lot of these uh, gas absorption features are mitigated. Uh, as you can see, of course, there is a wealth of information hyperspectrally than what you would see from, uh, you know, from multispectral data. So this, this is really exciting. Um, so challenges and opportunities. So, um, um, so I, I just wanted to tell you, tell you that we did not solve everything here. But because OCI uh, is, has amazing capabilities, there are also a lot of new opportunities that we can use for uh, for, from PACE. So challenges in the atmospheric correction, and these are long-standing issues and we are hoping to solve, is uh, there are, of course, the strongly absorbing and non-spherical aerosols, that's a problem. I did not, um, in the aerosol models that we talked about before, we uh, assumed weakly and non-absorbing aerosols only, but if you have very strongly absorbing aerosol, like carbonaceous aerosol and so on, that also adds to uncertainty in atmospheric correction. So we really need to have b uh, better information about that. And when you have absorbing aerosols, of course the aerosol vertical profile has an impact. Uh, UV signal um, is, uh, atmospheric signal is too large, uh, uh, primarily from coming from the RLA. So doing atmospheric correction in UV uh, can be a challenge. Uh, primarily because of the aerosols and also modeling the relay scatter. So we really need to have very good radiation transfer models to do that. Uh, the IOPs in the UV is a problem. And the reason we need IOPs in the UV is because we still want to do this BRDF correction. So we, we don't have any information yet about doing BRDF in the UV. So we need to explore that. 
Uh, we also need to improve our modeling and bio, uh, bioptical modeling in, in near infrared and shortwave infrared. So, because we're going to more heavily rely on the near infrared sphere in extremely turbid conditions, we want to have better bioptical modeling. We also want to improve the gas correction. Um, most of these uh, gas correction models, we, assume, we decouple the absorption from the scattering. But when you have, in reality, there is coupling between absorption and scattering, right? Photons get absorbed and scattering in the same medium. So, uh, so we, we need to improve our gas correction models by coupling the absorption and the scattering. And th this issue primarily, this is a primarily an issue for uh, oxygen and water vapor. And of course, the adjacency effect. And then the final thing is the, um, um, the opportunities is that the, uh, we will have the UV measurement capabilities to retrieve ozone, NO2, absorbing aerosols, and uh, uh, turbid water atmospheric correction. So the UV, something we need to explore. We will have great sphere performance that will help us with this multi-band AC algorithm. Of course, the hyperspectral nature of the instrument can allow us to better model um, the, uh, the ocean and the atmosphere in a simultaneous retrieval process, which I think Peng Wang is going to talk about next. And the, of course, the synergy between OCI and the multi-angle parameter is a unique thing for, for the PACE mission. And we also want to utilize that information to do better atmospheric correction. And I will end with this beautiful slide from Ryan. <laughs> this is a slide. Ryan can talk about it better, way better than me, so I, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you say a, a word about it. I will just raise the volume here. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we're gonna produce uh, MP4 or MP3 <laughs> products from OCI too. <laughs> That'd be cool, right? <laughs> okay. I think I took so much time. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, so the rest of the OCI. That's it. Just ask a question. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, it's because Haiku sucks. <laughs> there is um, Haiku. Uh, it's not uh, like a well calibrated instrument. Uh, so there are actually uh, there are known issues um, in the um, in the calibration of Haiku. Uh, that part of the spectrum. Anything below, like maybe for maybe 420 or 450 is actually not that great. Uh, but of course, um, there are also other issues in uh, uh, near infrared that impacts also the, uh, the aerosol correction. So it's primarily calibration issues with Heiko. Uh, with OCI, we shouldn't expect to see these problems. It's gonna be a very well calibrated instrument. Uh, we will be able to do a lot better than these kind of things. You know, like Avris is a little bit like better calibration instrument. So we're actually doing a lot better here. But it's um, still, you know, like it's not gonna, our, uh, the RS is going to be a lot smoother from, from OCI than this, this kind of thing. Yes. Yes, so, yeah, yeah, we, I mean, like, the, the point of this MBEC algorithm is we actually wanted to do better in, in highly turbid and coastal waters, so we expect to see better uh, RRS there. Um, it depends on the, in the, in the, how well we do in the shortwave infrared, like, the, the instrument performance, but based on what all the engineers said, we, have, we will have a really good performance, and we did a lot of analysis where we showed basically if we use, even if we only use all uh, sphere infrared bands, 
uh, the short wave infrared bands, we can do a very good uh, retrieval. The uncertainty is, is good and w within the margins that we want. Yeah. But I'm, I'm sorry, I might have missed it, but you said yes, it is a pixel by pixel insert section, or is it a team wide section? No, it's pixel by pixel. Okay. Yeah, each pixel is independent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Snow on, um, um, I think that's well. The this this algorithm is primarily for ocean retrieval. Uh, I think there are people in the pace science team. Andy, maybe can talk about this. There are people in the pace science team uh, who will do atmospheric correction over land, but I don't know if over snow and ice. Um, I have no idea. No. Yeah, that would be the opposite end of, <laughs> of things. <laughs> yes. Um, I have a case. So, um, some of the algorithms, I think, in the Kenneth or the local symbols, how often are those updated in terms of the transition? And then, uh, from the list, so uh, <laughs> the, what algorithm is going to be applied to the list of what algorithm would be what? I can't hear you. Oh, lake regions? Yeah. Uh, for um, your question regarding about the lookup tables, uh, we update them every time we do reprocessing. Uh, if there are, you know, like right now we're actually working on updating the lookup tables, uh, moving from uh, ready to transfer code uh, by uh, Ahmad and Fraser. And right now, actually, we're going to use a, uh, the race transfer code by Pango Anjai. So that would be a major update because it's a lot more sophisticated uh, race transfer code. Uh, you, regarding your second question about the lakes, we will probably use the same algorithm for lakes too. It, uh, but of course, you know, there are caveats to the lakes, uh, depending on the altitude and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but the algorithm uh, should handle these things. And, We'll be able to retrieve lakes similar similar to what we did for all of the heritage missions, uh, but because of the sphere, we we should be do we should be able to do better. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Maybe I should take someone from this side. Yeah. Uh, anyone from? Yeah. yeah. Um, thinking about the white section, I assume that like during a specific time, that's more challenging, like during hurricane season. Does the model? You're saying like during hurricane seasons you would get different aerosol like like. Oh, sorry, so the white. Oh, white caps. I'm sorry. I heard that. Okay. Um, well, the the uh, the white caps uh, model that we have is we mainly work for what we call the um, undeveloped seas, which means that um, non-stormy conditions. <laughs> so if you have like hurricanes or anything like high wind speed condition. Usually it's, that is coming with cloudy pixels. So it's, we cannot do retrievals anyway there. But uh, for, um, for white caps, um, correction in, um, you know, it's wind speed dependent anyway. So we'll be able to, to ac um, account for the white caps depending on the wind speed that we have coming from ancillary data sources. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that's a great question too. But the wind speed is um, because, as I said, uh, the uh, OCI kind of measurements are highly ill-posed. Uh, you cannot retrieve everything. Uh, so you still need to constrain the wind speed information. And uh, the way you do that is you get the wind speed from, uh, from models, like ancillary data sources. Uh, so these models basically take information from various sources and put them together, and then it gives us these smooth, nice, uh, spatially and temporally data. Uh, and then we can use that as, the, um, uh, as, a source, uh, as a source for the wind speed information. Of course, the wind speed models are coarse uh, spatially, uh, so it's hard to... Um, um, uh, so there, of course, uncertainty is introduced from that. And we do account, so we're, we're going to talk about uncertainties in, on Friday. We do actually account 
for the uncertainty in the ancillary data, um, like wind speed, uh, into our retrieval. So, so it is part of the, uh, the calculations. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. Do do we? We don't have time for. Okay, just keep them going. Dude, like, he's gonna buy us all beer. Oh. <laughs> and then we'll learn about ocean anything except for our rest. So just go ahead. So I had a follow-up question from Kurt. Yep. So I work in the very two deep water, in the real estate that you showed me on the first slide and the last slide. So do you think that the the atmospheric correction algorithm is gonna work there? Because I, I'm not sure about this, but can the You're, 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 you're saying BRDF correction? Did yeah. you say BRDF? Yeah. The okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, th yeah, this is a great question. And, uh, yeah, I mean, like, we know BRDF in coastal waters breaks down a little bit, right? Because these BRDF correction models are calculated for case warm waters, uh, open ocean conditions. Uh, and then uh, where you basically have like strong uh, anisotropy in the scattering of particles, but in, in, um, in coastal water, you have this uh, more multiple scattering when you have like uh, ocean particles there, and then the BRDF becomes very different, becomes more Lambertian. So yeah, you have a lot of uncertainties, uh, not significant uncertainties, but you do have uncertainties coming from that in coastal waters. Uh, but we, we're actually working with Panguang, for example, on developing a uh, new and improved BRDF that can consider uh, any kind of water conditions uh, and will likely be implemented also for, for PACE. So this is an open research area and some of the people in the PACE science team are working on that. In fact, some people are working on retrieving a BRDF from the multi-angular polarimeter. Because of the multi-angular aspect, you can actually get uh, improved BRDF. Yes. Yes, you're, you're in the back, yeah. Um, like, like what kind of aerosol products would you be interested in? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there, there are, uh, for the level two data for, for in general, for all of the ocean color products, there are like standardized, uh, products like RRS, uh, aerosol, optical depth, uh, the angstrom coefficient. Um, those are the the products that we will be providing, but because we also have the CDES uh, package, you'll be able to actually take the OCI data and process it yourself to get whatever intermediate information that you need from the atmospheric record. So you will have that information, but you would have to process it yourself or request from OPPG to process it for you or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Yep, yeah. So that's a, a goal for us. Um, as you know, that I don't know if we talked about this before, uh, Jeremy talked about this or others, uh, there will be a level 1C product uh, for PACE, where, which basically uh, it, it's, um, uh, it's, it's the level 1 data uh, com uh, from combined from different instruments from OCI and multi angle plurum to combine on, a, uh, on the same grid. So basically, you'll be able to, from the same pixel, you'll be able to uh, get information, hyperspectral information from OCI as well as a multi-angle polarimeter. And then you can use that information to, to constrain the aerosol properties. Uh, there has been multiple algorithms, including some of the algorithms that Peng Wang uh, is developing, um, which is basically the, the fast maple, the maple algorithm Peng Wang is going to talk about next. 
uh, that uh, this multi-angle polarimeter is really capable in treating the aerosol properties better than any other instrument, and we we want to use that information to constrain the atmospheric correction for OCI. So we're working on these algorithms. In fact, I uh, I actually just published uh, a paper uh, where we're basically using Bayesian framework, where we use the uh, what we want to do is use the the pri uh, prior uh, use prior information from the multi-angular parameter, use it. Um, as a constraint to the atmospheric correction for OCI. So it is something actively working on. You uh, uh, You still need to rely on some kind of aerosol parameterization, either a lookup table or inline radiative transfer codes or things like neural networks or something like that. You need some kind of physical model to constrain the, the process. So you still need some information about the aerosol whatever format it can be.